Well, my job as a predominantly a feature film editor is to, first of all, uh, read the script that uh, the director is intending to make and uh, see if there's anything in there that I want to pass on uh, comment-wise as far as how it reads. Uh, and then um, basically be there for the entire time of the shoot. Uh, and again, you know, it's, it's basically my responsibility to keep up with the camera, make sure that you're editing each sequence as best as you can. I mean, everything's shot out of order, but you do what you can. Make sure it makes sense and make sure you've got the coverage to do whatever you might want to do with it. Uh, because obviously on a feature film it's very expensive on a day-by-day -day shooting basis and if there's something missing you better put your hand up or it's a, you know, half a million dollar problem. Well, basically I'm on before the camera starts rolling. Uh, I'm not on during pre-production but uh, I do have input into the script. Uh, but then I'm on through full production, full shoot, all the way through post, basically until we release not necessarily release the film, but we have all the contractual uh, obligations fulfilled for a complete film. So on a feature film, you're on it for about a year in time. Well, I think when you're offered a job, uh, it is some, you've got to be very careful when you're in an interview, especially if you're working with someone new, because you are going to be spending an incredible amount of uh, time with them. And it's, it can be a very intense period, specifically post-production. So if you've got any feeling that you're not going to get on with this person or you're not in any way like-minded, uh, I would recommend running away because uh, otherwise you've got a year of hell. Uh, if that's not the case and during that period you, you realise that you're both like-minded, uh, I normally find um, when I'm meeting someone new or about to work with someone new is you talk about movies, in, not necessarily the movie you're going to work on, but the movies you love and uh, without exception you know as you listen to the director talk and they listen to me talking if you're all kind of on the same page with what you love and what you like and what turns you on about movies uh, you know you're going to get on and if they're talking about films that you can't stand you know you're not so it's a good idea to be convinced that you're in sync um, for one of better for want of a better term, with the way everyone's looking at the project. Because I think being an editor, you're being cast as an editor as you would cast a composer or cast a cinematographer, or in fact cast an actor. It's, you've got to fit in with the overall picture, otherwise uh, those working parts are not going to come together. Well, I think it's just a relationship you build over several pictures. Um, when you start, you're testing each other's views on you know what works and what doesn't and making adjustments to suit uh, so the beauty of a long-term relationship with a director is that it becomes and, and with any other head of department or crew member is there becomes a shorthand and a, and a uh, expected performance thing that you on a new film meeting new people you know you're forever having to explain again the process of what how you like it and how you think it should go and I think that's why there are such long-term relationships formed because that's time and that's time you could be putting into the film yeah we work together well I mean I, I just think we like the same thing so if I'm liking what I'm doing I'm very convinced that he's going to like it when he sees it or she's going to like it when she sees it depending on who you're working with and if that wasn't the case again you've been miscast or or you're not a good fit with that particular director so I never second guess what I'm doing because I think that's the other thing that can go wrong it's like I'm not doing it to please someone else but by doing it to please me it's pleasing them and again, that's just built up over, you know, a long, a long term relationship. I think uh, when I first read Chris's draft of Dunkirk, it was scary and exhilarating because normally he's a heavily dialogue oriented uh, scriptwriter. So you were always pushing the narrative forward through dialogue, whereas uh, Dunkirk was very, very little exposition and uh, it, it was going to be a very visual film and, and the visual storytelling 
you know, is what was going to make this film worth watching. Uh, and of course, you layer on top of that the intersecting timelines, which Chris loves to play with time. You get this kind of war movie like no other, which is not reliant on, um, you know, carnage and, and blood in the camera and all that kind of thing. It's reliant on a, a level of suspense that Chris said early that he wanted to maintain. He wanted to run this feeling of your heart beating away right from the first frame of image. You're starting to get tense in that first gunshot. Boom, you're tense pretty well all the way through the movie. And uh, it was very experimental. When I read the script, I was thinking this could be a $100 million art movie and probably be the end of all of us. But thankfully it wasn't. The uh, land, air and sea uh, concept was built into the script, but of course when you're in post-production and editing, um, where those points changed and converged and where you allowed the audience in on the multiple timeline gags were all controllable. So we spent a lot of time perfecting where we moved from land to air to sea and back again. Um, may, probably in the first construction it was quite confusing because a lot of times you went back and you'd been away from one of the components for too long a period so you'd be sort of thinking I'm, I'm not sure where I am or what's happening and then it was just a matter of continuous processing to get it to the point where we felt the audience could sit through this reasonably complicated pathway, still enjoy it, and even if a few of them didn't quite catch what was happening, they'll catch up with it. Um, good confusion versus bad confusion. So that was something that, you know, we tested and tested and tested amongst ourselves and with some close friends who weren't related to the film. We did a lot of screenings of Dunkirk until we thought we had it exactly where we needed it. Well, we'd We'd screen every Friday to ourselves and a, maybe a couple of people who hadn't seen the film, just as in my editing room, just as a matter of process. And every Friday we would have developed new ideas and changed the structure. And it was interesting because you'd see improvements at a couple of screenings and then we'd try something, you'd see a complete, we'd look at one other and go, you know, we can't turn the film off, we know it's not working, but we'll let it run because the poor people who've come to look at it haven't seen it before. But, and they were never harsh on us, but we could tell that the, the move that we did had damaged the emotional side of the film or the uh, ability for you to follow it. And it was surprising how, with a few small changes, you could derail this film and with a few small changes you could lock it into a much stronger path. Well I always uh, cut you know and produce the sound as I'm going and uh, but interestingly on this one we cut it more like a silent film in the first pass because we had IMAX cameras that basically extremely noisy um, which is quite distracting if you're editing. So between music, sound and visual effects um, where Andrew Jackson from uh, Double Negative, uh, which is based here in England, he was doing all of the visual effects, which are which basically you can't see them in the film and you shouldn't see them. The, f the film was very heavily shot in camera, uh, but the visual effects are actually beautifully handled be because of that. Like where you'd normally put a CG plane in the sky, we comp in an actual plane that was from another shot. We never let them use CG elements and so 99.8% of this film is 100% practical and comped very carefully together. So we're working with him because we're developing that the whole time and unlike most other films made, when we were at week 10 of the director's cut, we mixed, uh, did a temp mix on the film and then we projected it for the studio on 70 millimeter uh, with all of the visual effects in the movie. So to the studio's eye, they're watching a completely finished film and, and we kind of, that's a, a thing that Chris sort of imposes upon everybody, which is when we do that first studio screening, it looks like a finished movie. But the fact that we screened it on 70 millimeter, I think is, I doubt there's ever been a film made that did a 
an, a work print 70 mil screening with a mix at that point, which was very cool, looked amazing. I think the biggest challenge editing this film was just one of keeping it accessible to the audience and keeping the audience with us and not making it so complicated that people just gave up and, and got confused with what they were looking at and just keeping the tension level up and, and keeping the exact point of the emotional release when the little ships showed up with Kenneth Branagh. Uh, that was a really critical moment because if we moved it slightly earlier or later in the timeline, you didn't get the emotional rush that you did when it was in its exact position. And we tested that numerous times because we were trying to pull it forward and trying to push it back and it just found its natural place. That was a big challenge. Um, and I think just, you know, keeping true to the reality of the situation and not letting you know, not letting it be inundated with CG enhancements was the other challenge of, you know, not doing shots with 10,000 little ships coming at you, because that's not what happened. <laughs> so, you know, trying to keep it much more real. Uh, and I think the audience know that. I think um, inherently when you watch a film and you see a shot and you just know it's been loaded, you kind of, well, I do anyway. I sort of go, yeah, right. <laughs> a million ships on the horizon, it's like, what, all at the same time? I don't think so. So anyway, that was a challenge. But aside from that, it was just, you know, an exhilarating film to work on. So it was cool.